What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hatness, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Malu Sikema, and we talk about purpose and how to have a conversation about purpose with highly rational people. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, why don't you visit workshops.work and download my free one-page summary. And now, enjoy. Malus, I'm very happy to have you here today. Very glad to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And we're going to talk about purpose. Yes, sure. <laughs> I was looking forward to it, so I'm really happy to be here. <laughs> yes, and I'm especially interested in exploring how to tackle such a, air quote, soft topic with, right. air quotes, rational people, engineers, who are mostly your clients. And before we are getting there, I always love to kick off the conversation with the question, when did you start calling yourself a facilitator? And actually, do you? <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting question because um, I actually called myself a facilitator for a while and then for a while I stopped because I never used it anymore. <laughs> and only recently I've been working again with some facilitation kind of activities. So it's a mixed, it, it, the, I can give two answers actually. <laughs> Because uh, when I went to school, I did a design engineering study and there we had classes on facilitation. So it was a, a, a real topic for us to, to be a facilitator. And, and so it was really part of our professional education, let's say. Mm -hmm. And so at the beginning, also after I graduated, I used those kinds of tools a lot. I also did some freelance work as uh, a brand designer and did sessions for that. And uh, then after a while, uh, as an innovation designer, I did a lot of, uh, or innovation consultant more, I, I, did, I did a lot of one-on-one um, -on -one talks with industrial SMEs. So mm -hmm. I learned a bit of the facilitation part. <laughs> and uh, now that recently I have uh, launched this uh, game on purpose. And so the facilitation has started again. <laughs> so yes, and, uh, only recently, I think a couple of months ago, we I've really been active as a facilitator again. Mm. So. And I think it's fascinating that um, you learned or that facilitation was an actual topic in your studies. So I would be curious to hear from you, what does facilitation mean to you? Yeah, I think that facilitation is very much about engagement and getting people engaged in the topic you're talking about. Uh, and sometimes it's even more about that than about the results. Mm. And so when I was in my university, my it was all about design. And then the sessions were about creative facilitation. So it was all about convincing people that they were creative and that they could translate, you know, their reality because we used it as a, a customer research tool, you know, so you asked people from the your target uh, group uh, to come to uh, co-creation sessions and these are regular people with regular jobs who are not necessarily creative people and it was all about you know giving them the the confidence that their ideas matter to us and uh, so this whole getting the creative juices flowing was a, a big part of that But uh, right now in my job, I work a lot with the industrial SMEs and the, uh, the management teams of companies like that. And the, the sessions are often a lot about them understanding why the topics is important, what, uh, what we're talking about, uh, uh, and also to give them the idea that they had some a sense of influence on the decision-making process. And really the first part of those sessions are all about getting engagement and, and uh, making everybody part of the, the feeling like an owner, you know, uh, an owner of the topic. Absolutely. And I think the difficulty is, no, let me first ask, what do you think holds them back to really buy in and to be convinced that their voice matters? Yeah, I think that... Um, a big threshold. I don't know if that's the right way to say it in English as well, but at the start of a session is that the problem is that people are always very used to be passive. You know, they, they want to 
hear what you have to say and they have to become active. I, I, I'm sure that you have talked about this a lot in your podcast already. And so, yeah, the, this threshold that you need to pass it, that people feel like an owner and they feel like that their influence is really important. So at first they're a bit hesitant, no, not hesitant, but also a bit critical, you know, they don't, they are not convinced yet that they, they feel like you need to bring something to them and that they are the receivers. And, I always want them to feel like they have some kind of responsibility, especially if you're an outside person who is not necessarily part of the firm you are working with. They have to understand that they are the owner. You know, after a while, I'm gone and they are the ones that need to, you know, take it over. And yeah, and it's also very much about positivity, right? That uh, dealing with the topic that you're working with, uh, that it's a cool thing to work on and it's, it's not... Uh, just a thing that is pressing down their calendars, you know, <laughs> that's uh, the time is money and uh, they don't have time for it. But, and so that needs to be switched around that it's fun and positive and they want to work on it and deal with it. So, Yeah. And I wonder to what extent it's about solely the facilitation to really get them this into the space and to find the confidence that they can and have something to contribute Or to what extent it's also based on the attitude maybe of the leadership or the sponsors of the workshop or the session? Because I, I think it's very much a cultural thing as well, right? So how do you do you align with the client beforehand or how do you how do you get them into this moment? How do you get them over this threshold, as you said? Yeah, I completely agree. I think that I also heard your previous podcast, I think, or one before that was about change. Mm -hmm. I think it's really very much related to that, that change is also, if you're doing a session and it, uh, the goal for, uh, for the session is to create some kind of change, then the role of the leaders is crucial. You know, the leaders need to support this because otherwise you can, and it's, it doesn't really matter what the desired change is, but they, they need to have the freedom and the time in their work to, to spend time on, on this particular change. So, Often what I do, well, right now we're going to talk about purpose. And when you we start with the topic of purpose in a company, uh, the first step is to do it to let owners or managers work on their own purpose definition, just to let them experience what it is all about and to really make them believers, you know, <laughs> because then they are ambassadors and they it can trickle down, you know, they can be supporters for the employees. So you would work with the leaders separately beforehand on this purpose statement? Well, not all leaders, but the, the decision makers, mm -hmm. right? The decision makers need to be convinced to do some kind of trajectory. And uh, so often, you know, if I do a, an intake or, you know, a sales pitch or something, <laughs> this is the point where we already give some kind of free session because that convinces them of the power. You know, this is all... A, a bit about game-based learning, right? And this is a very difficult topic to sell. Games are fun and they are very convincing and uh, bring people on board and motivate them to do something. But it's very hard to explain. People have to experience it. And uh, so that's why in the very first contact moment, the decision makers are taken along into the experience. So they get to experience the fun of it and, uh, and what it, it uh, brings to them. And, uh, but uh, besides that, you asked me whether I want to do the leader separately, but no, I don't because, you know, they should be really be a part of the team. And well, it also very much depends because sometimes, especially in, uh, in SMEs, you have the situation where leaders are quite, uh, well, totalitarian, but, you know, they can be quite hierarchical, you know, they, they, they can really feel like an old fashioned leader, you know, mm -hmm. and, always trust that the, their employees can have a lot more responsibility and so that's when you can take out the leaders from it and let them see what happens when they are gone you know and so that's also a very powerful way to uh, do sessions I feel but yeah it, it's very uh, situational it really depends on the company and the kind of problems they, they encounter yeah, and I think if it's about purpose as you said you need to have the buy-in of everyone and everyone needs to be aligned and the leadership needs to 
actually lead by example. Mm -hmm. And you just mentioned that you're working with games. So now I see two challenges. It's the big topic of purpose. What does purpose actually mean and why is it important, especially in I'm not so experienced to work with SMEs, but as you said, they're hierarchical. I think they're very hands-on. Mm -hmm. So how do you get them to first understand that purpose is something that is important to work on and then to use games in order to tackle that? <laughs> well, you know, it's really funny because for this specific target group, I always wiggle it in secretly. <laughs> so I never <laughs> say that we're going to talk about purpose, you know. And so when I start a new contact with a company, I always enter at the topic of innovation and grants and applying for grants to finance innovations. And so uh, when you're talking about innovation, eventually I ask why, you know, why are you going to introduce this innovation? And so that is where the topic of purpose comes in. And that is the point where I say, okay, but why does your company exist? And do you know, and do you know why the people that work for you are here and why they are happy or maybe they're not happy and what do they think about this innovation and you know how does that all link together so that's the way <laughs> sometimes you have to the especially what you also said before when you're working with rational people on elusive topics like purpose it is important to start with the stuff they understand and then let them feel the pain or the the need why it is still an important topic, you know? So, um, for instance, also re recently, I, I uh, was invited to a company that is merging with another company. And so when you say, okay, but what is their purpose? What is your purpose? It doesn't really mean anything to them. But once you start to talk about, okay, but what is something that annoys you about them? You know, then the you and them part of it, the silo stuff, mm -hmm. because Comes very big and it, they immediately go loose and understand okay yes this is the pain and so that is how the purpose of topic nee, the topic of purpose sorry how that you know immediately is obvious that it's important because why do you fight over very small stuff there's a reason behind it because you find other things important and that's fine that's completely fine and you don't have to change it and maybe you will grow together but maybe you won't As long as you are aware of this fact, it's much easier to talk about it and to uh, come to an agreement. I find this very, very smart to first show the gap to identify, to bring forth what they actually really care about. Because I think we mostly get annoyed about things when we deeply care. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They kind of touch our inner belief systems or our morality ethics or whatsoever yeah i love that uh, yeah that's great <laughs> yeah 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 and how do you then build the bridge again because at the end of the day yes it's it's important to to find these moments of care and how do you then bring it back together yeah this is all about workshop design right mm. Uh, and I, I always find this a very situational thing. So it completely depends on even the kinds of people that are in the teams, you know. So and this is what I find very challenging in this part is to think on your feet, you know. So you're in a meeting with the director and immediately at that point, it is very important to create some kind of peace of mind in order to really understand how to design the best workshops. You know, <laughs> because if there are people that are a bit unwilling to participate, I would do it completely differently than if I know that the, for instance, the problem is in the management and the people on the on the work floor understand that they, you know, they are willing and they want to solve it, but they need more responsibility. You know, that's a completely different way to even on the topic of purpose, it could be a completely different way of uh, approaching it. Can you give an example? Yeah, okay. So for, maybe it's good to explain that I designed a cards game for purpose definition. So what I said before, I was working with rational people, industrial SME uh, owners, and I wanted to talk about purpose and I found it very difficult. So it is, I designed a card set that has 49 cards and they are separated in seven categories. And so it becomes very pick and choose 
to define your own purpose. So it's a very simple concept, but there's a lot of research has gone into it. But what I do with this card deck is completely different in various situations. So for instance, I work together with a Canadian web shop reseller who resells my uh, card deck, and they are also fantastic uh, session designers. And recently they did this kind of um, a session where they let every department use the card deck separately and then let them combine them together. And so they also uh, let the management decide how to do it for their own department. So the, they just gave complete the assignment to the uh, management, to the department leaders. First session was for everyone to build their personal purpose, you know, because companies can have a purpose, but the person ca can have a purpose too, you know. And so the first session was that uh, it was completely hosted and all the individual people, they got to build their own purpose. And then the team leaders were given the assignment to, within two weeks, come to a common purpose definition for every team. And so this, for instance, this is a very good solution if uh, a company is very into the silo thinking, you know that, right, these, these kinds of, you have the marketing department and then the HR department and the R&D department, and they all are silos. They don't work together at all, you know. And so in that uh, case, you can very well uh, make a purpose definition for every uh, silo, let's say, and then bring them together and let them understand how every silo has their own purpose and also their own strengths but together the company as a whole has to function together right and you cannot miss one of those departments because then it doesn't work anymore and that becomes really obvious to everyone if they are asked to to finalize you know one animal for the whole company and so this animal. is the bottom up right what do you mean by animal <laughs> oh <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm so used to my own <laughs> vocabulary. Yes, yeah, so the card deck I designed, it is about, uh, I told you just that it's uh, 49 cards that are mm -hmm. divided in seven categories of uh, uh, purpose values. And these seven categories, they are animals. <laughs> so you have the, the, the collection of purpose values about connection, the, the category about connection. It has as a symbol a fish because fish, they are social creatures, right? And so there is a category of uh, values about safety and security. And the logo for that category is a bear, right? <laughs> so that's why I said animals. <laughs> and what are the other five? Now I'm curious. What so did you have connection and safety? Yeah, and there's progress, trust uh, and wisdom. That's trust and wisdom. Then there's competence, progress and freedom. Mm -hmm. did I say one? Uh, yeah, performance. I said progress twice. So performance is the seventh one. Yeah, so these are seven. So what I did was I analyzed hundreds of corporate values and I understood that I, I figured out that a lot of values were actually very linked together, right? So, uh, for instance, if you look at the connection category, I came across corporate values that are all about uh, empathy uh, and, and uh, bringing people together, but also uh, open and honesty. So they are separate values, but they're both very much connected to the purpose of connection, right? Of, of being connected to other people, And so I've made these categories and, and making seven categories becomes much more, you know, understandable and, and uh, relatable for someone to build their own purpose definition instead of picking, you know, out of the thin air, uh, anything you can just uh, think of yourself. Absolutely. And what crossed my mind is that when I hear all these words and when I think of corporate vision statements they're usually filled with buzzwords yeah right and i think the problem with buzzwords is that we all tend to not oh yeah we should have openness and transparency in, as a company value or we must rely on trust but then when you ask different people about what trust actually means you get different answers and different interpretations, definitions, and different applications to what it actually means in daily life or daily interactions. How do you tackle that? 
Yeah, I think this is really important. So, and that is why the goal of the card deck is that you build your own animal. So these seven times seven uh, cards, you are choosing seven cards that together also become an animal, right? So you have a fox's head and uh, a deer's uh, arm and the heart of a bear, you know, and so this becomes your own unique animal. But that doesn't really answer your question because what it, how every animal is constructed is that the arms and legs are the how, you know, how are you going to achieve your purpose? And the heart is uh, why, right? So you have this, uh, I think that most people know the golden circle, right, of Simon Sinek. And what's behind that tool is a very ancient old principle, which is called the Socratic ladder. So at the very top of the why question is, Purpose is the ultimate why. But if you go down, you go to the how, right? So if I ask you, what do you want? You can always ask, why do you want it? But you can also ask, how are you going to achieve it? So that, this is the starting point in the purpose definition already, that the cards that you pick for the hands and the feet of the animal, they are much more concrete and much more into the the how, you know, what are your strengths and competences and what is your character? What are your character traits? And concrete stuff that you will use to, to, uh, to actually achieve your purpose. And then again, there are many ways that uh, we are working on a very big facilitator's guide to start using this as an input for further concretization. So, for instance, in the branding field, there is this great pyramid. It's called the Cap Ferrer's Pyramid. And it has a, a template to bring it down to a very concrete definition for a design brief so that you can put in your purpose definition in your design brief. And that is how it will end up in your products and services and whatever you are offering. Right. And so this is the way to also bring it to a website design or to your HR strategy or to R and D, you know, there's this, but this step, this translation step from purpose to either behavior or design, or uh, even the way your company is constructed, right? The the way, you know, enterprise design really. Uh, there are all all kinds of ways to bring it back into uh, reality. So this is a very big book, so I won't bore you with it. But there are ways to uh, connect to other existing and very well known tools. So you would first start with the with the heart, with the why, uh, the company's purpose, and then see how the what and the how relate to that. Would you then also do you often find then maybe contradictions that while doing the exercise you realize that actually the way how we are doing it or our behavior don't actually help us to really achieve this why. Yes, that's very true. And, you know, it's almost a guarantee that you will find some kind of contradiction. And it can even be that the vice president has a different heart card than the president. And so that will result in different, you know, KPIs, because eventually he finds different things important. So by making this very clear for everyone, It is confrontational and painful, yes. So that's a warning to facilitators. But it is also very important. And it is a starting point to discuss uh, why this is happening and how you can resolve it. And now I'm, I'm really curious because I think one topic that is rarely discussed amongst facilitators is the danger of opening a box and creating expectations from the group that then cannot be fulfilled. So mm -hmm. when I think back of the beginning of our conversation where you said, okay, it's important to have everyone opening up and recognizing that they have a voice in this decision-making process and to define the purpose. And what if you have contradictory or different priorities that come out? And then at the end, you have the president who says, and now I decide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, this is uh, uh, this is reality, you know, this is how business often works. And I think that it really depends on the kind of company, what kind of uh, consequence this has. So for very small companies, 
uh, I must be honest, there's not a lot you can do. You know, when the CEO says, okay, this has all been very fun, but this is just the way how we are going to do it. Then the only alternative you have is that you have built your own personal purpose and you can see the difference with your own purpose and the one of your company. And this can lead to the painful discussion or a discovery that you might not be in the right place. And so that's fine. You know, that's also a result. And you can maybe even say, okay, so working at this company does not lead me to be happy in that sense of my purpose. That's fine. This is just my money-making machine. And my personal purpose will happen in my in my free time. So I'm doing something for a good cause or, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I get fulfilled by doing some kind of freelance job or or just a hobby. That's fine. You know, that's, that is a personal decision. Uh, well, now I'm, of course, talking about HR specifically, but there can be different aspects of a business where purpose, well, is, can be entered. But if you're working with a management team and when someone puts their foot down and they say, okay, this is the purpose of the company, this can really become very obvious that that has been the problem in the decision-making process all along. And so this gives the people who are uh, having trouble to communicate with this person, it can give them the handle to say, okay, now I get it. Now I get why we can never agree in the management team meetings. And we always have to, you know, have it run late until very late at night. <laughs> and that is, um, I think, talking about purpose and making it concrete like this, it is a very powerful communication tool. Mm. Because then again, as in the example you gave about the merger, you point out the differences mm -hmm. and the cracks in the system. And then you have the opportunity to actually combine them or yeah. bring them together. Yeah, but of course, always it is key that the quality of the person who is dealing with the aftermath, it will make all the difference, right? So if you just do that session and then you don't do anything anymore, yeah, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> There should always be some kind of follow-up plan to make sure that the problem gets resolved or get at least improved, you know. Would you consider this part of your responsibility or the responsibility of your clients who actually hired you? Well, that depends on the contract and the, and also their own abilities. Mm. You know, Sometimes they there are some very suitable people in the company who are all of a the sudden they you know they understand this and they are they turn out to be very powerful project leaders in that sense and so then you can take a step back and and let it happen but sometimes it doesn't happen on its own uh, but then of course yeah in the final final end it will always be the responsibility of the company but if it is a bigger project uh, I will always want to leave the company in a state where I feel like they actually have resolved something or they have been helped you know <laughs> Yeah. And at least they have the tools then to follow up. And also, you know, I think what's a, a very important difference in this case is that in this case, I'm the tool designer and I always want to tell the people who are using it, which can be other facilitators. I want to give them all the tools they need to also let the tool have effect. Mm. You know, so there's also another difference between being the creator of the tool and the user of the tool. <laughs> Those are also two different roles in this uh, thing. Hey, since you are listening to this podcast, I was wondering whether you get enough opportunities to exchange, practice and experiment with other facilitators. Have you heard of the Never Done Before Facilitation Festival? It's a 24-hour global event that is co-created by its participants and delivered by some of the most popular workshops work podcast guests. Visit neverdonebefore.org for more information. Use the code WORKSHOPSWORK to get a 20% discount. The festival starts as soon as you join. Now, back to the show. To come back to an earlier question, how much time would you spend to really define these words like connection, like trust, like safety? Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I've done a lot of research. So I've spent a lot of time uh, categorizing uh, 
and just you know putting uh, check boxes how do you call them little marks behind the words just counting words you know so when you're analyzing hundreds of corporate values the most important ones they come floating to the top automatically and uh, what was really interesting is that for me it was originally a dutch game and i translated it to english and so i had the help from someone who was very talented uh, also to find the exact synonym that would fetch the 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 exact meaning of the word i was looking for you know and i think that the bit of research in the science okay, okay it's not scientific right but still the quantitative part of it I was turned a little bit more into that people sometimes can give something more meaning, you know, and more importance and a better, better loaded. You know, it's, this is so hard to talk about because it's not a concrete thing, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, but uh, sometimes people are the ones that can just have the right input to choose the right word to get across what the point is you're making, you know? So it's not all research, it's all also human-powered. Uh, uh. Yes, and I think it also really depends, again, on the company culture. Because, for instance, transparency can mean that every employee knows about the salaries of everyone else. Transparency can also be that you're very transparent about the aspects that are not transparent. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. trust can mean that I can trust others to comply to all the rules or a trust can mean that I trust that everyone will respect me on a very personal and emotional level. I completely agree. And the language part of this is super, super important. And I think that's why a purpose definition should always be a conversation starter, right? It's, it, you can put it up as a picture on a, a banner in the corner of a, a cafeteria, you know, but it will never mean something in that way. So it needs to be a topic that is talked about and every person in a company has their own responsibility, but also their own freedom to bring their own value to every word, their own meaning to every word, you know, and, and also their own skills to fulfill a certain aspect of uh, a word that was chosen, you know? <laughs> but yeah, I, th I think it is really, uh, especially the word transparency, I've come across that a lot. And I find that, uh, for instance, if you are working in the legal business, uh, you're, you're some kind of lawyer company or, or something, um, or a finance company, and you choose the word transparency, I always find that a bit challenging because I think, yes, of course, you know, of course you should be transparent. I wouldn't be want to be your client if that wasn't the case. And so I always think that a purpose definition should also be about, uh, you know, print it out, put it on your closet and it should be aspirational and it should be challenging and it should help you to progress towards a direction that you're not already there and it is also a way to differentiate yourself from other companies or, or organizations or people in the same sector so what do you mean for the people you are uh, serving let's say yeah and as you said beforehand it's the heart of the animal and thereby it also helps with directions of okay if you're about to take a decision or go in a certain direction. It's kind of like a, a guideline. Especially, you're completely correct. Yeah, it's all about uh, direction. And uh, as we sometimes say, it's the North Star, right? So for every decision you make on every level of the company, from very small to very big, it helps you to make the right decision. And sometimes I use the word corporate intuition. So especially in self-directed companies, you know, this is the new thing, right? That, that departments, they need to be self-directed and they, uh, uh, people, it's also about the Rhinelandic and Anglo-Saxon models. Okay, if you want your personnel to be as free as possible and to, to be in their own strength and to have some kind of thinking freedom, you know, then they, you need to trust them to make decisions that are right for your company. So if they are, if self-directed people and teams are very well aware of the purpose of your company, then you can give them the freedom to make their own decisions in the right direction. And this is what I call corporate intuition, right? So it's an intuitive decision that they don't have to think about it because they 
understand and it's part of their DNA what the purpose of the company is. But of course, that is a challenge, a challenge, right? <laughs> yeah, but it makes total sense. And then also be very clear what this, yeah, again, this trust aspect means. Okay, I trust the division or the department to take their own decisions. And I also trust that if they are unsure, they would come back mm, exactly. in order to ask. So, yeah. yeah. In your experience, what makes a workshop fail? Yeah, so I think that this is all about uh, engagement and about passiveness. As we already said before, both things. But I really think that a, a workshop will fail when the introduction is very long and the people who are starting the session are talking too much about themselves because they find themselves very important. And they think it's crucial to tell everyone that they are super cool. And so you're listening and listening and thinking, oh, okay, yes, you are very important. But th it, this is, so this is why in sessions, I find it crucial to start as quickly as possible with doing something, you know, because then you're not passive anymore. And so the ego aspect should be not in the equation. I agree that if there's, especially in the beginning, someone who who speaks too long, yeah. whoever that is, it just sucks all the energy out of the room, especially when it's online. Because as soon as someone speaks for longer than four minutes, flop, 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 there are new tabs going on <laughs> yeah. and then you lost them. But how do you, because that's a, this is, I think, a valid question for, I can imagine that your audience has great ideas about this, right? about how to interrupt someone who is talking too long. <laughs> yes, yes, very true. And I always think that it's um, the best way is not to give them a stage or to brief them very clearly. Because what I have realized is that very often the leaders in the beginning when they speak too much, I don't think that it's because of they think of them thinking that they're important. Yeah. I think it's a lack of preparedness and that they have the impression that others expect them to say something smart or to, to yeah. put the thing in a bigger context. And then they come up and they get into the blabbering. And usually in certain positions, you're just used to blabber because right. nobody interrupts you. Exactly. So yeah. I would tell the clients, okay, there's a two or three minutes introduction, just say hello and say that you support this and what your own expectations are and then shut up. Yeah. yeah I also really love to use some kind of uh, alarm clock or something like mm. that. <laughs> It's one. so stupid, but it can really work. And I also find that if someone is very long, uh, a long talker, then all the other participants are also annoyed. So if you interrupt that person, it can be, A good thing for the vibe in the session, yes. <laughs> but still, it is. It sometimes it's so so hard to find the right point. It is But hard. Also, I think the courage it takes to yes, you might relieve all the others, but to what extent do you know? I think you really need to know the client and to know to what extent they would be happy. I think it's always good also to just say it in the beginning. Okay, if something takes too long, I take the liberty to interrupt you just for the sake and the good for all of you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and then they laugh, but then yeah. they also understand. And then at least you get permission. Exactly. I completely agree. And yeah. you said that you you like to start with doing quite early than in the workshop. So what's your favorite doing exercise? Yeah. Okay. What I really love, but it's also because my sessions are all about purpose, right? So sometimes I ask people to bring an object that is very, you know, representative of themselves as a person. So what object would you bring? Maybe, Miriam, you could look around and see if you can find an object that really represents who you are and what you find important in life. <laughs> oh, oh, this is daunting. So um, <laughs> since uh, the audience cannot see, but oh. the only object that was close enough, which is not a liquor bottle, <laughs> I'm sitting <laughs> in my living room, is a sand clock. Yeah, a sand clock. Wow. And a very pretty one. Yes. And I think it's, um, I like to be purposeful of the time. And I, 
I get, uh, we were talking about things that I know annoy us a lot, showing how much we care. So it annoys me if someone wastes my time. Or right. I have the impression that I'm wasting someone else's time. Yeah. So I think um, actually the sand clock is a good example. I love that. And why do you think that time, do you think that the word time is also important to you? Mm, good one. I think the use of time. Use of time, yeah. Yeah, I think time is a very complex and concept. As I'm such. taking this over your interview, but <laughs> <laughs> when is your day well spent at the end of the day? Mm, meaningful progress. I think if I had the impression that I could make progress in whatever my mission, vision is, or I could have a meaningful impact or learn something. So, yeah. I love that. <laughs> yeah, I think this is something that would be very close to your purpose, right? Okay, but I interrupted you. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Huh. Huh. <laughs> I don't know what you did here. <laughs> but to bring it back to, so um, everyone brings an object or takes an object that is close to them. Your favorite exercise. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, what's really great about that is that it becomes personal instantly. And sometimes people are very brave and they bring back the most personal stuff, you know. And I love that. I think that's so great that such a question can elicit uh, a personal conversation that quickly. Absolutely. And it also it brings in the personal touch and also the connection, especially now when you're virtual, the connection between the analog and the and the online space. Yes, you're completely right. Yeah. Would you put them into breakout groups or would you let them share in a big group? Yeah, okay. Well, this is a very important uh, thing because we have had some experience lately with the topic of purpose online in bigger groups and in smaller groups. And I think that the topic of purpose should be talked about in small groups because it can be lengthy You know, and it is sometimes, you know, it is a mix. What you are saying is a mix between uh, what's interesting to only you and what's interesting to the whole group. And so it shouldn't also, again, not be too long about one person at the same time. But still, you do need uh, quite a bit of time to get to the, the hot spot <laughs> of someone's purpose. You know, so smaller groups are good. And uh, so I'm still... We are currently working with group sizes around four to six people. Okay, and when I'm saying we, I'm talking about Traction Toolbox. This is mm. the Tamara. She was also on the yeah. on the podcast episode 40. Yeah, and they're fantastic partners for me. So they resell the the purpose, the Zenith purpose game. But when we're talking about purpose, we love to work with group sizes of four to six people. And then a month ago, we did um, Design Your 2021 conference of uh, E180. And they had group sizes, I think. Yeah, they were quite quite large. And still, so we did breakout. Uh, well, I think, how did we do it? Oh, yeah, I, you know, okay. So what you also can do when you're talking about purpose, you can either do a breakout room and do the four to six people and then let everyone talk about their own choices in a certain order but you can also make it a completely personal experience and not let anyone share anything you know what i mean so mm -hmm. back they do it on their own and then you have these reflective questions uh, that are uh, set uh, beforehand so they can be on a worksheet or they can be on the screen and people have to write down their own answer for themselves and this forces them to think why they made certain choices so this is the real reflection that is of course always the job of the facilitator or the coach right but if you're in a very very big group then this is still a way to force people to think further about the choices they have made uh, and then still you can even uh, after it is done that way you can make breakout rooms and where people can talk about what they found or learned yeah uh, Or some people can be volunteers to talk in front of the whole uh, group. So I think that the whole community has learned a lot about e-hosting, right? <laughs> Last year. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. And the magic number of people with whom you can have a conversation. What is, what is your, your, your uh, average group size? So I love to work with breakout groups. And then the 
big group size doesn't actually really matter because I agree. I think that we cannot have a real conversation with more than maybe five people. Larger than that, there are some who are zoning out and some who are taking over. But breaking the group into smaller groups of maximum five, but I think the sweet spot is two, three, four. Right, yeah. And then varying it. Um, and then just coming back if a group wants to share. Um, yeah. Just a summary of the yeah. the good old one to for all structure. I must say that personally, I'm not talented enough to both be the day host and be the person who clicks and does all the breakout room thing, you know. So <laughs> we usually do that with the Traction Toolbox. We do it together. So one person is the host and someone else does this technical part of it. Which makes total sense to have a tech host. Yeah. Or in that area. <laughs> and just because you mentioned it, that the conversations about purpose tend to be lengthy. And I can imagine that having a game to structure the conversation already makes it easier because you break it down into the different parts. Mm -hmm. How do you bring it back together? Yeah. Uh, so I always bring it back together by talking about what's coming up next. So uh, if you're talking about individual purpose, which we do a lot because That is how people can experience what it is all about, right? And then the end is, okay, so now you have made your purpose definition. What's the first big decision that's coming up next week? And how will your purpose definition influence this, this decision? Which is a beautiful reality check and brings it back to action. And sometimes we even do that beforehand. We ask, okay, so why are you currently talking about purpose so sometimes someone needs a new job right they're not sure whether they are happy at their current job and so if we ask beforehand okay why are you talking about purpose right now they say okay i, I need a new job and i don't know what i want then at the end of such a session you can say okay now you've made this animal okay animal right <laughs> this purpose definition what does that mean for your job choice yeah what kind of job openings what kind of openings are you going to look for mm. and do you have the impression that for the companies who were actually not aware of the purpose part but wanted to talk about innovation mm. <laughs> um, does the purpose conversation then goes fast or what's the impact of the purpose conversation on the innovation conversation yeah well innovation is all about what can you do very well and what is the need of the client right because maybe you can do something or you need to develop to do something better and then you can do something that will help your client better and innovation is to have progress in that sense and so i feel like purpose a purpose definition should always have this part in it uh, about what do you think is important but also what are you good at in order to achieve what you find important. And so that's so very close, right? You should only innovate in the direction of fulfilling your own purpose. And fulfilling your purpose as a company is all about your client, right? Because that's the raison d'etre of the company. So it is a very important and very big thing. And there are very concrete ways of implementing purpose in your innovation process. So you've probably heard about uh, design thinking, right? Where uh, you have five very clear stages and at the start of every stage or at the end of every stage or both, you can definitely revisit whether you've, the first phase is actually to define your purpose and to define the purpose of the client, yeah, to, to do customer research about that. And then at every stage, it is like your bill of requirements and revisit whether you are moving in the right direction. And the same goes for agile, you know, uh, the daily stand-ups and the uh, retrospectives. It is a perfect way to implement purpose in uh, getting it into the re the, your own result, you know. Thank you for that. <laughs> You're so polite. <laughs> yeah, that was a very nice kind of frame around, around the purpose in action, applied purpose. Right, yeah, I love that. Yeah, I think it's really important. So uh, there's a big uh, facilitator's guide coming up where mm. this, especially this part of how to use 
your definition is, is all about, uh, is the topic of this uh, guide. If there was one advice you could give someone who wants to push their company or team to have this conversation about purpose, but they feel the resistance, what would you advise them to convince? Yeah, I think that the resistance is always about the fear of people to talk about to spend too much time on, you know, the fussy consultant stuff, you know. <laughs> and so I think that people do like to talk about their own job and their own speciality. And so if you can just talk about a person and really show interest in their task and their job in the company and then start asking why, you know, using the Socratic letter principle, okay, but why do you do it? And so how is my job and your job connected in so what are we striving for together? And so the end result doesn't need to be a very vague thing. It can be quite a concrete statement of what you want to achieve together. But it's all about the, the coherence of the different tasks in a company together and how they together contribute to one and the same goal. Is that a good answer? I don't know. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, why? Uh, let people talk about themselves and then ask why they're doing what they're doing. <laughs> This is yeah. the Socratic matter, Socratic way. <laughs> and I like that you then said um, to find out what is actually connecting them. What is the bridge between what they're both doing and how they can achieve more together? Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you. If someone for any reason fell asleep after minute two, just woke up and doesn't have time to listen to the entire conversation. <laughs> What would you like them to take okay. away? Okay, maybe we should make a big noise so that everyone wakes up right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me think. I think that if you're listening to this podcast, you already know that purpose is important and it's all about explaining purpose to other people. And I think that, so why is it important to talk to people about purpose to each other is to understand each other to create common ground and to make more stuff happen and get less frustrated in the job that the company was created for wonderful <laughs> thank you so much for your time and for sharing your expertise and your your game with us Thank you so and much. I will put all the links in the show notes so that people can find, the audience can find more information. Yes, I that. yes, it was a great conversation. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.work to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day.